Hello, Midnight TCG members. This is Midnight Fox. We're coming to you with this week's Competitive Edge podcast. This week we have Genzaki in the background, who's not going to speak this week. We have Genzo. How do? And Eddie Phoenix. Meow. This week we're going to title Freestyle. And uh, been a little dry on a few ideas and trying to come up with some... Uh, New ones. We're hoping you'll help us out next week. Uh, go into the member Q and A and posting your questions. Uh, but this week uh, we're going to discuss the YCS Costa Rica and uh, like the distribution of deck lists, why they did the way they did, so on and so forth. So, I mean, we could see that. Uh, I mean. Not unamazingly, windups uh, again have the majority of the wins, followed closely by Fire Fist with other variants running at like a uh, hero variants and Karakuri variants were took up the other twenty five percent that would have equaled what windups did, but uh, anyways, so. Just our thoughts. Uh, for me, looking at this breakdown, uh, we had six samurai at six point two five percent, which I'm amazed with. Uh, Dojo at three, and just the back row hate that six sams allow. I'm amazed to see only 6.25% of the deck list in the top 16 actually come out of that. And then Which is only one. Have... Oh, wait a minute. Windups. I was wrong in the first one. Windups are at 6.25 and Mermel was at 25. Knock, knock on my head. So maybe they have been killed a little bit. Mermel's, I'm unsurprised. Macro Rabbit. 6.25 um Insector 6.25 Heretics at 6.25 so I mean we've got a at least a somewhat diverse amount of decks in the top 16 um uh, so okay my breakdown looking at it 25% on Mermel's I'm not surprised they are right now the go-to deck until like um, the elemental dragons hit us and we get the baby dragons and we get the harpy support. We'll probably see more of that, so I'm not surprised to see Mermel's where they're at. Uh, they are pretty competitive. They have so many retarded engines that make the deck autopilot that uh, yeah, it's just it's an uber broken deck. It's easily played. Uh, Kari Curry variants? I'm kind of surprised to actually see that in there. They're starting to gain popularity again, but I just never realized that people were going back on the uh, kick with Kari Curries again. It kind of seems with the way the game rolls that when we find a new deck, we move on and the old variants disappear, even if we get good support to support a deck. In Zectors, I'm amazed to actually see in there because uh, basically on DN and everywhere, I haven't really seen a whole lot of In Zectors played, so to see it actually... In the graph in the top 16, it's kind of amazing. Heretics, they're another one that's uh, just kind of dropping off the radar. Bubble Beat taken, I think, was probably the most amazing thing to everyone, was that Bubble Beat won. But Heroes with a Skirido, Shining, and all the support they have and the abusage of... Uh, Super Poly have made them a really competitive deck. So being able to run a deck that's very spell and trap dependent is not so bad 
for heroes. And Fire Fists uh, running a second on that. Not surprised either. Uh, Water and Fire <laughs> pretty much uh, running the YCS there in Costa Rica. So, uh, Ginzo, what's your uh, thoughts on the breakdown? Uh, first off, it, it's kind of similar to all of the TC TC turn uh, excuse me TCG tournaments um, that go or that uh, take place below the North, uh, the United States border, um, in that they're they're generally uh, there's general uh, variety to the tournaments more so um, he, than here in the states, uh, and generally there's an odd winner. And again, I think this is the case because if you would ask anyone before YCS if they thought a uh, hero variant would win, uh, I doubt very many or very few people would tell you that 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 that's what they felt that you know somehow hero would you know triumph over a field of fire fist and mermail. But as far as the represent representations of the deck, um, I think it's important to note you were calling out the percentages. Um, but it, when Fox said 6.25, what that means is in the top 16, there was one representative for that. So all the decks with one representative would be like the Six Samurai, the Wind Up, um, the Insector, the Hieratic. Those all had one representative. Um, and the hieratic was Paul Cooper, who is uh, a pretty talented player from here in the States. And if I'm not mistaken, in Swiss, he went 9-0. He was undefeated. And um, so that's pretty impressive, as well as his day two performance. Um, I guess, like, the, um, the most obvious um, feeling I get from the tournament is that I, I expected Fire Fist and Mermail to kind of be the two best decks. Um, the two decks that would challenge or that should challenge at a YCS event. And they, they represented uh, quite well. Mermel with four representatives in the top 16 and Fire Fist with three. Um, but what's not taken account uh, or taken into account with this graph that I made here um, is the variance. Uh, because this, this list of top 16 decks could even be broader if we look at the Karakuri variants, I'm, I'm sure that one of them is the kind of standard Karakuri variant that we know now. It's kind of this turbo uh, kind of uh, variant. And, and I want to say that the second variant was a Karakuri Girja uh, variant. And then you have the Bubble Beat uh, hero deck. And then the other hero, if I'm not mistaken, was a combination. I think me and Eddie talked about it before the podcast. It was Hero and Fire Fist. So... There was a lot of variety, so you know I, I don't think it really surprised me due to the location. Um, but I think the decks that I thought would do the best, or that I thought should do the best at a YCS uh, level event, uh, did the best. What's your thoughts, Eddie? For me, hearing that Bubble Beat, a deck that by a lot of players' opinion seems to be have fallen off the trail or off the high end tournament play hearing it has come in and decided to take top at a tournament that isn't in like North America or like Europe it impresses me I have to say to see that not only is there still a good bit of variety for the game it also shows that you can never underestimate any deck that goes into a tournament from now on, it seems. Is that all you have to say on the matter? Eh, just about. I mean, it seems like you and Ginza have covered everything else. Oh, I guess we should mention, though, that, um, <laughs> excuse me, I was mentioning the successful day that Paul Cooper had with Hieratics, which if you follow YCS events, you know um, he is constantly topping, constantly being a presence at these uh, premier events with Hieratics. Not only was his um, day one undefeated, but also in the, the, the top 16, uh, he, he was second place. He lost out uh, to the Bubble Beat deck. So I agree with Eddie that it was surprising that Bubble Beat's, uh, the Bubble Beat hero variant uh, won. Um, but I, I don't know. You, you kind of say, like, how good was the player? Because 
like I said, us U.S. players, we know Paul Cooper's name. We know how good he is, with, especially with that deck, uh, because he does so good with it so consistently. Um, but you you don't want to you don't want to say well the guy won because of luck because a lot of what high radics do are based upon luck and the, their ability to continue a turn you know in regards to their opening hand so I, I don't know I would I would have liked to seen the the game or uh, read the feature match of it uh, I don't think it's up yet um, but also a, a kind of important aspect I'd like to mention is I, I I would like to see decks and I'm not sure if YouTube has been bombarded with uh, deck lists at this point i haven't checked uh but they don't have it on the konami site which is par for the course at this point but uh it would be interesting to, to see these decks you made mention of the l word in there that always brings a bit of a twinge to at least my ears because when it comes to this game there's a little bit that goes into that L factor that you mentioned of luck. Because, see, for me, you can be, like, the worst duelist on the planet and probably be handed a deck like Heretics, a deck like Windups, a deck like Insectors, and be able to run them no problem. Just being, like, one of the worst people on the freaking planet because the deck is just easy to just learn and spam. So you, I don't, I don't you call that I, luck or skill, or in a sense? I don't know if I completely agree with that. I've seen some people get handed a top-tier deck, and they did not understand the engine. For I mean, sure. I, I agree with that as well. I mean, I, I do agree with Eddie, but I also agree with you, Fox. <laughs> um, I do believe that the decks are so pre-constructed before you even open the pack you you know one of the great skills that i think this game is losing is the ability to to, to build a deck correctly and efficiently um but that's not really required in a lot of uh, aspects anymore because decks are so like when you read the cards you're like i have to play this i have to play this and then you have a few maybe cards that just get weeded out and it, especially after somebody is successful with it you know you no longer have to build a deck you just have to go online and find the deck list um so I agree with that aspect of Eddie that some people can just be, they can just draw a win, you know, versus earning a win as maybe in the past you would have to. You would have to make better decision making over the course of a match versus I open better than him or I open the counter to, to his opening. Um, but I also agree that, that there is skill because, you know, take windups, not this format or maybe even so this format, but it's a deck that I've seen people go out and spend the money sit across, and I'll use my personal experience, sit across from me with the deck, and I could be running maybe some little gimmick deck like uh, Charity Rabbit or something, which I was running at one point, and I would just school them, and it's because, you know, a lot of these players, or I won't say a lot of these players, I'll just say there are players out there who just try to buy a win, you know, and so they don't know, they, they may know like the basic combos, or, you know, I, they may draw a hand that's really obvious, um, but the skill for any of these decks comes into making the best out of every hand you get over 10 rounds um, and making the best decisions you can possibly make, the best reads you can possibly make over 10 rounds. So I, I agree both ways, actually. <coughs> we, uh, well, I mean, that's pretty much the breakdown of uh, YCS Costa Rica. I mean, we got a deck breakdown... Uh, I think the, I still think the most amazing thing is to see something like Bubble Beat take it. But uh, as you said, uh, you know some of those rogue decks just take people by surprise. I mean, I had to give props again, uh, but I mean, look at Jarrell and when he went over to Japan and he busted out Exodia. You know, it's a rogue deck. Nobody thought about it, and then all of a sudden you see Exodia being played. Yeah. So, it's, it's, it's one of those things where once you see those rogue decks coming in, people start looking at it and they go, oh my god, I'm going to just take it and run to the bank with it. And it'll get hot for like a month or two, and then once people see that they can't take it and run to the bank with it, they'll just drop it off and go to the next hot thing. Well, I think the thing with it is, is that... Uh, 
people don't side for those decks. They side for Mermails. They side for Windups. They side for Fire Fists. They side for the big decks that they know are competitive. So when you come in with these rogue decks that shut down some of the engines, it's just like, okay, I don't have an answer for that. So How do I side against not- this? Or yeah, maybe maybe it's not necessarily um, um, a surprise factor as much, but I think you know, like in in regards to what you said, like you know, people aren't signing for these things. Um, maybe that has a little bit to do with it because if you can't side uh, for these unique game states that that will come, you know. In, when you, once you start playing the match, you know, like if you can't effectively defend them, even though you know how to beat the deck, um, that, that could have something to do with it. But I did want to make a real quick statement because I wasn't saying, <laughs> and, I, and you know, maybe you guys didn't feel this way, but I also just want to put it out there that I wasn't saying that anybody at this tournament was lucky. I, I was just saying because I don't, I, we don't have a feature match to read to read yet. Like I, I want to know how Bubble will beat, beat the Hieratic, you know, especially because the Hieratic player wasn't John Doe. It was a player that we know very well in the States as a, a very quality player. So I, I was just curious to see how he won. You know, was it like poor hands or was it smart plays? Was it, you know, a dynamic kind of uh, game? Was it because uh, Paul Cooper didn't have a side deck or good side deck options for, was for healing? Was it out? Was it a freaking back and forth? Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, that's... You know, I wasn't saying anyone was lucky. I just was unsure of how the game com- you know, com- came to its conclusion. And that's one of the things that you really got to think about and look at when it comes to this game. Is there are some players who will rely on their skill. And there are some players who will rely on getting that luck of the draw kind of thing. And then there's just that just random thing that happens when it comes to the game like one player will draw better than the other and just blark yeah it's kind of too bad you know we're all not one of those like Yugi players or something and when they have the heart of the cards just draw that right card at the right moment I've done that a few times before that's for me it's called top deckalicious (laughs) and for me we all know that when it came to the freaking anime Yugi was able to stop time, run home to his grandpa's shop, pull whatever card he needed, and then come back, place it on top of his deck, and then unfreeze time. <laughs> so. <coughs> well, we actually did get a few questions now that we've kind of went over YCS uh, Costa Rica, which we might go into a little further as we get more info later on. Um, well, one last thing. Um, I do want to congratulate the U.S. players. Uh, from uh, from what I was reading on the coverage page, there were 12 North Americans, two being Canadians. Um, but I, I would like to say uh, congrats on the, the good placements. Uh, I'm looking at top eight, and we had two U.S. players, uh, Wilson Sang playing Mermail, and Paul Cooper obviously playing Hieratics, and he got second. So I just want to say congrats to those guys. Yeah, congrats, guys. Okay, first question, well, they actually all come from King Die Pie, but uh, he says, do you think KZ Flames have a potential to be able to compete with Meta in the future? What do you think, Genzo? Mm. Um, I have to say, I would, I would rate the deck... Uh, from my knowledge of it, you know, maybe there are some really diehard uh, Hazy Flame players uh, out there who know more about the deck and how it actually draws, you know, so on and so forth uh, better than I. But I-, I will say that I kind of view it as like an Insector deck or a Six Samurai deck, you know, a wind up deck. Maybe not of the same quality, but kind of in the same range, you know, like right player right circumstances you know but just at, at this point you know like uh, you know when i first heard about the deck just like every deck well, as soon as i hear about it you know and i start seeing any kind of buzz any kind of information on the deck i look into it and some decks you know 
uh, retain my interest, and so I delve into them. You know, especially if it's a deck that I'm just like, this is obviously going to affect the meta, so I need to learn about it. Whether I'm going to play it or not, I need to learn about it so I know how to play it, which then leads to me knowing how to defend it and how to how to beat it. Um, and so I was the same same way with Hazy Flame. I like some of the in- interesting cards that the 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 deck dragged back into play or maybe for the first time dragged them into play like uh the normal monster level six tyone number two i think um so i I see the the plays it has and i've actually watched a few games uh i I just don't think it has i don't i don't think it has the potential to even be constellars you know i think constellars will be a decent deck once we get we get the cards but i don't think constellars will consistently compete with the decks you know on the horizon so i I just kind of put it at one of those decks that uh, it's probably a budget deck so um for the right budget player you know it it may be able to do some work but i don't think you can really bank on it you know putting you over the top in in the the matchups that you'll see with it well for me my thoughts on the deck itself uh I mean, it does allow Swarm, which is very popular right now. Uh, it is easy to go into rank 6 Xyz monsters with the deck. But, I mean, with our rank 6s being so limited as far as good effects, I mean, probably the, one of the best ones is um, Photon Strike Bouncer. Yeah, one of, the, one of the best rank six exceeds monsters, kind of kills the playability of it. Uh, well, I will say that they have their own rank six, that hazy hazy flame basilatrice. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a decent card actually, and I've I've actually been um, keeping up with the game like always, and have noticed that some monarch players uh, have recently added. Thestalos back to their lineup to get access to this guy. Um, and I've seen them use it to um, pretty decent results. Uh, it's just another option, just like, you know, probably, uh, like you said, Photon Strike Bouncer is probably the best, you know, consensus best rank six. Um, I personally like Insector Exabeetle better. Because it's generic and it's u- it's a utility card that does a lot of work. Um, I obviously think that Strike Bouncer is a better card overall, um, but you know I think Basilatrice is, is a nice aspect to the deck. I just don't think that the deck itself, you know, its parts and pieces equals you know to something that's going to. I don't know. What do you think wins? The rank six in a battle of Vixies, what wins? Rank six or rank sevens right now? You know, it seems to me that rank six, you know, just doesn't equal up to the rank seven. I think the biggest thing is is getting the full effect of Basiltris. I mean, if you can get five level six fire monsters, you can get them up to 3,500 attack, and then you can't be targeted or destroyed by effects. Which Good. means the only way to get rid of this guy is by battle. And a lot of cards are not going to be able to get over him. But it's just the ability to hit the field with five level six monsters to get that full effect. I think he's a work in progress. I think a good tech card into the deck, possibly, if you're really wanting to go for that, is to maybe look at manticore of darkness just for his discard ability to bring back a bring him back to the field and he is a fire monster he is a level six and the hazy flames are beast warriors so i think that would probably be one of the most effective ways to try to get to the five level sixes to put under him but the chances of comboing into it, I think right now it's a work in progress deck. I think it needs more support before it's going to become competitive. Does it have potential? Yes, but it needs more support to bring that potential out. I think the Manicore of Darkness is a good mention for the deck, um, just because... Uh 
in the initial stages of development when um <clears throat> excuse me we were hearing information about the easy flames and getting cards and you know people who were playing on dev pro Yu-Gi-Oh pro dual network we, we obviously get the cards a lot sooner than we actually get them uh legal to play in the tcg uh mana car of darkness is one of the original kind of like tech tech throw-ins to the deck uh because it kind of made sense but i will say it you know, from player two players I know personally who still fool around with the Hazy Flames, uh, I, I no longer see that card in the deck. Um, I just think of them as a tech option because it, it does run a lot of Beast Warriors, and I mean, it is a good card to get back out and spam. And you have your graveyard effects with the Hazy Flames, so. If you're discarding something, a Hazy Flame monster, you're going to get use out of it being in the graveyard. That's why I think Mana Core is not such a bad option to look at. at no, at it's not terrible, especially in an underdeveloped deck. Eddie, your thoughts? I do not have any other than saying good freaking luck getting five level six monsters on the field to be able to <laughs> try to do that little run over thing no well their defense is low so rekindling is helpful in this yeah that, that is one of the setup plays but I still don't like the idea of, of trying to strive for the five because it's so it's, it's such a lame duck effect these days you know this cannot uh, be destroyed by card effects because I'm just D prison is a, is a super relevant card Fiendish Chain is a super relevant card. Compulsory Evacuation Device is a relevant card. Um, and all the, all those effects are just like, we don't care about you, your super investment into something we can easily control. So, like, I actually like his just standard, you know, when you use two uh, fire monsters. Once per turn, you can detach one Nixie's material from this card to target one monster your opponent controls or is in their graveyard. Banish that target. Um that alone, that and that's the kind of effect that I see when the Monarch player is running uh, Illusory Snatcher and Thestalos. When they when they make the Basila Trice play, that that's what they use it. They just use using for the utility uh, to banish uh, a face up problem monster, and he has twenty five hundred attack, so there's nothing to scoff at as well. <coughs> so our next uh, question from KDP. Is do you prefer Girgia Machina or Girgia Karakuri and why? Which do you think is stronger in this format? Is that directed at anyone in particular? Or? Let's uh, let Eddie go. Just, yeah, let's let Eddie go first. Repeat the question, please. Do you prefer Girgia Machina or Girgia Karakuri? Why and which do you think is stronger in this format? Not sure, honestly. Because for me, there are few decks that I normally pay attention to keep up with. And Gear Machina and Gear Karakuri are the two that I haven't seen come up. Or I know very much about at the moment. So, I can't put a side on this. So that's where you two come in. For me, when you look at it, Gergia Machina or Gergia Karakuri, I think it really all depends on how you want your deck to play. I mean, if you want field presence, then... Hold Gergia on a second. Hold on a second. Ben, the question was, which do you prefer, Karakuri or Gergia Karakuri, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, not Machina. Oh, well. Yeah, Girgia Machina or Girgia Karakuri. Oh, that is the question. The Girgia variants. <clears throat> I mean, with, with Machina, Girgia Machina, you look at Field Presence, which can be great for XC summoning, synchro summoning, spamming the field, what have you. If you're looking at draw engines... Karakuri is the way to go because you can use the effects to switch battle positions and keep drawing, keep your hand full. And that's a hard toss-up for me to say. I mean, which is better? 
you know, field presence or car curry, I'm going to say, or hand presence, I'm going to say hand presence, because torrential, mirror force, uh, dark hole, and so many other destruction cards can wipe your field out in a matter of moments. So having a hand built up is probably more important now than having a field built up because that field can be blown to bits in no time flat. We've got Torrential at 2, we've got Dark Hole, we've got Mirror Force at 2, we've got cards like Wind Up Zen Mains, so many cards that offer destruction that I think having a hand is better. So I'm going to say that I think I would prefer Giragia Karakuri because it does allow for dynamic hand plays so that you're not going to get laid into the game and not have a hand and lose. I think it's going to offer you the better options. There are still the synchro abilities and the Xyz abilities with Giragia Karakuri. It's just a little slower. But in my opinion, it's more dependable because you're not going to overextend like you will with Gyrgya Machina. What's your thoughts, Ginzo? Um, I, I need the question one more time, please. Do you prefer Gyrgya Machina or Gyrgya Karakuri? Why and which do you think is stronger in this format? Okay. So, I think you got that backwards. Because um, the gear, the gear gear Karakuri deck is probably going to want to go off on a much uh, uh, much more consistent um, level of play, and uh, gear gear Machina is probably going to generate the hand advantage um, because their general plays are going to be set armor, flip, add gear gear monster, or summon gear frame, add Machina monster. And then at some point, overlay two level fours into Gear Gig and X to again add another, you know, level four lower machine to your hand. Um, I did play both of these decks um, when we first heard about Gearja. Because initially, Gearja was a really solid, you know, kind of idea. I, re I really liked what the monsters did and how they interacted with each other and the end results you could get from them. And uh, of course, the, the first initial variant was gear gear machina because it's just machines you know and they're all earth they kind of just you know they all kind of work together and so that was the initial kind of like variant that you worked with and a lot of it was you know set your armor armor and then set some traps to protect it you know so it was kind of like it wanted to grind it wanted to get to, to control the pace of the game um and then along came the Karakuri variant, which um, it's been a while since I've played the deck, but I want to say it maybe ran, <clears throat> excuse me, three Karakuri tuners, uh, level three and two level fours, um, strategist and the watchdog, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it, it became a much more explosive deck. It, it played the game in a different manner. While it could still play in, in a slower paced game, you know, all the cards kind of led their way to an explosive, you know, kind of dynamic uh, game state. Um, which one do I think is better in today's game at this moment? Hmm. I would just say the Karakuri because it because of its explosiveness, um, because it can combat, you know, uh, other explosive decks like a Mermail uh, deck. You know, they'll, they'll put up a field, big field, attempt to end the game or at least put presence on the board to let you know that their intent is to end the game soon. Karakuri, you know, they can go through a, a, a sequence of plays that leads to a big field, maybe even a bigger field. Uh, while, again, the Machina is kind of a slower, more grindy game kind of deck. So I would just say in today's game at this point, the Karakuri variant, because of its explosiveness and speed, would probably be the better choice. Alright, well, 
I think we already got Eddie's view on that. So we'll let Eddie start off the next one, too. Uh, because I think we kind of overshadow him tonight. Uh, best deck, in your opinion, this format and the next? Best deck, in my opinion. Well, see, the thing is, we haven't gotten at least one of the probably upcoming best decks, in my opinion. Um, I'm gonna... S I, I see Harpies coming in and taking off a good bit. They're not in full play just yet. <clears throat> so, for me, I'll say uh, Mermail slash Atlanteans. Until Harpies come out. Then once Harpies come out, they'll probably become really hot for a while. And seeing those two decks going into the next format, depending on if Konami really hits the Mermails, Mermail Atlanteans, I could see Harpies taking the top. I'm going to go a different way on that. I think, considering we found out that we're only getting the Adult Dragons... I think with uh, Judgment of Light, I think it is. Is it Judgment of Light or Lordy of the Tachyon Galaxy that we get the adult elemental dragons? Is it Lord? Uh, I think it's Lord. Yeah. Okay. I think right now the big decks that are going to hit and run the meta is going to hit at the end of the month. That's probably going to be your Constellar and your Evil Swarm because of all all the hype that's already behind them and their abilities to spam, exceed summon, uh, uh, using heliotrope, uh, it still abuses a rabbit engine. I think that, uh, my opinion, evil swarms this one with some rogue elemental dragon decks. I think harpies may come up a third under that. Maybe they'll take second until we get the baby dragons. But I definitely think once we have the baby dragons and the adult dragons next format, elemental dragons is probably going to run the meta next format. What about you, Ginzo? Um, just a reiteration and maybe a little more um, in depth. Um, insight into uh the question so i think cons the consensus best deck and it's it's also my opinion uh as well at the moment the the best deck is is, is mermail it just does so much um it can answer so many different decks um any problem that any other deck creates it, it can answer it um in game one or game two game three whichever however you want to look at that um so it's definitely the best the best deck hands down at the moment um but there are some um we'll, we'll talk about one other relevant um deck at the moment which is fire fist and and I'll, i'm only mentioning it because once these next two packs come out i'm pretty sure uh the decks we have in their current form which are legal to play will change um uh, well uh, and if they're not getting new support they will have to adapt which again will will lead to change uh, because the Fire Fist deck is going to become quite a different uh, creature once it gets um, chickens and uh, the other cards. Uh, it's going to start doing the level 6 synchro uh, for Beast Lord Vulcan and the uh, Fire Fist synchro. <clears throat> so that deck will change and will be a contender. Um, so so right now, you, you have Mermail as the best deck. Fire Fist is probably the second best deck. And I'm pretty sure that's 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 a consensus. Um, again, there are other decks like Karakuri, which is making a strong a strong presence right now, um, with a lot of players running it because of its because of its explosiveness and the kind of like uh, soft lock monsters you can put on the field, like uh, Notoria Beast, um, the Future um, Prophecy is another decent deck at the moment, and it's only going to get better. Uh, it's going to get incredibly good, actually. And a lot of that has to do with just one card, uh, the the Judgment Day. So that's going to be a factor. Um, I want to say Constellars will be a factor next format. Um, or we can't really say next format. Um, I, I think that question is a little too far into the future because we don't know every card getting released. Um, 
and even if we have a decent spoiler list from later sets in the year, we won't know the TCG exclusives. Um, so I, I think, um, I, yeah, I at least think that his question should be more short term because I think everybody's saying the next format because you know the next packs are really going to affect the game like generally a ban list would. Um, so that's what I'll stick with because there will be a change and it will be in the short term uh, because. Again, while I want to say Constellers will be uh, a contender, I'm not sure. Um, that, that's just something we'll have to wait and see. I like the deck. I like what it can do. I like its cards. But Evil Swarm, uh, a deck that has a lot of the same kind of mechanics, which creates its fields and its power plays, um, will definitely be a contender because it has the ability to shut Mermel out. It has the ability to shut Prophecy out. It has the ability to shut Elemental Dragons out. Um, if they have an Ophion with protection. So, Evil Swarms are definitely, uh, I keep on saying that format, um, they're definitely a soon-to-be powerhouse. Um, and again, Prophecy. And just as you said, you know, as soon as we get the um, discard dragons, the dragons that everyone's calling the baby dragons, as soon as those come out, Elemental Dragons, um, at this point, with the information I have in my head, with the experiences I've had with the deck versus other decks, I just don't see it being anything other than a hands-down best deck, and maybe by a long shot. So th those are my thoughts on uh, the current and uh, immediate future. <coughs> All right. And the last question is, what do you think of Crimson Blader? All right, I've got the card pulled up. I will read the effect. It's one tuner plus one or more non-tuner monsters. If this card destroys an opponent's monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, your opponent cannot normal or special summon level five or higher monsters during their next turn. It's a level eight fire, 2,800 attack, 2,600 defense. I'll go ahead and throw out my opinion now. For me, this only hits specific deck types. Things like Rabbit, um, I want to say Six Sams as well because they don't rely too heavily on the level 5s and higher. Windups don't rely on level 5s and higher. And certain Prophecy cards don't rely on those level 5s and higher. And other decks don't worry about it. So for me, this card is a bust. Um, Fox Q. Kinza? Kinza? You want to give your Fox thoughts for our day? Derp. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, so I definitely have the complete opposite end of the spectrum when it, in regards to Crimson Blader, because uh, Crimson Blader will become very relevant if it's not already re very relevant. <laughs> Um, any deck that I play at the moment that can create a level 8 monster, whether it be just from a Gorse play and then a summon of an Effect Veiler, I'm running Crimson Blader. Um, because you mentioned Six Samurai, uh, not relying on the level 5 or higher monsters, but not they're... Not any of them, if they're not already yeah, a but, presence. But their play that makes the game for them is a level 5. But I, I, I will give you, I, I will give you some credence in that theory, because... You know, if they go first, they don't care about Crimson Blader, right? Because they've already made Shein. <laughs> yeah, they made so, Shein you know, or... Yeah, so like if... But if they start slow, Crimson Blader could be a great, you know, position play to, to take their win away from them. Um, but outside of, um, like, the rogue decks... Or the on the side decks like Monarch is kind of a relevant deck now. It's it's already gotten several tops here recently in the last few events, um, which means if there's been a several if there's if there's been several tops, you can be guaranteed that there's thousands of players who've seen that information and go, hey, I like Monarchs now, and they're playing Monarchs. Uh, so Crimson Blader can shut them out because they always have that floating frog, which is an easy destruction through battle with Crimson Blader, and then they can't make a uh, Monarch play. Um, they can't summon. Um, a trag after the fact. Say you have Crimson Blader and another monster, you destroy their frog. Uh, your opponent cannot normal summon or special summon level fire hearts or monsters during their next turn. So wait, that wouldn't stop their trag, obviously. 
because it's their next term. But still, you know, if they don't have the Trager Gores, I should say that's my that's my hand trap <laughs> statement. Yeah. If they don't have that, then they're looking at a very tough next turn, especially because then they have to decide: Do I want to bring my Treeborn Frog back? If I bring it back, it's easy destruction. So the best choice is to not bring it back, and that leaves me open, you know. And I can't say banish a frog from the graveyard, special summon rodent toting, because it's the same result. Crimson Blader gets to eat up a monster. You can't normal summon or special summon level five or higher monster. You know, that's where your monarchs, your light and darkness dragon, they all get hurt by that. Um, Crimson Blader will will stop a high priestess of prophecy from hitting the field. Um, elemental dragons are completely shut out by this card. Uh, at least for a turn, you know. If, you know, but it's that that's like a, a tougher situation because a lot of what. Um, Elemental dragons are going to put it on the field. Uh, the bodies alone can help prevent <laughs> Crimson Blader from resolving. But say, like you made, say you were the elemental dragon player, right? And you go first, and uh, you just do the basic Drago sack, create two tokens, and your turn. Um, Crimson Blader. Now, if you can make Crimson Blader in your first turn, just saying for example's sake that you can. So you make your Crimson Blader and you attack a token. You know your opponent can't make any elemental dragon plays in the next turn. So you kind of create a tempo and have a pretty strong lock on the tempo, you know? So I, I just think it's really good. And also for the elemental dragon deck, they can make this guy quite easily. So like every version of elemental dragons I've built have had this guy in it. Every, every prophecy deck I've built has had this guy in it. Uh, because again, they have an easy, uh, easily summoned uh, level seven, uh, Elemental Dragons have multiple easily summoned level 7s. And, you know, you run Effect Veiler. That's, there's your Crimson Blader. Um, the Elemental Dragons, uh, some players tech in Flam Guard. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a level 1 Dragon Tuner. It's fire, so it's you can tutor it to your hand through Blaster's Banish effect. So, you know, you, you banish a blaster, add Flamble Guard, and then just special summon one other Elemental Dragon, Synchro. There's Crimson Blader quite easily. Um, Crimson Blader is going to be very relevant as far as presence in extra decks. Whether he affects the game, you know, that just depends on individual games as they come, you know. Because will you be able to make the level 8 Synchro? Will it be relevant? Will it be something you need to do? You know, that's to be seen because, again, you know... We're not there yet, but I, uh, as I'm saying now, like I still run it now in every extra deck that can make it. I, I really like the guy. It's just unfortunate. I will say this last comment about it before I pass it to you, Fox, which is um, it's almost an incomplete answer, though. Because, you know, say you summon Crimson Blader, punch over a monster, well, they can't special summon. And if it doesn't end the game, there's no big problem. What if they have Dark Hole? They just get him off the field and then wait a turn. So it's it's incomplete, but it's it's still quite quite effective, I should say. Well, for me, I'm gonna say just looking at the card overall. Okay, he's a warrior. He's fire. He's level eight. Uh, one tuner, one or more non-tuner monsters. What I like is that he's not very. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, He's not granular in how he's summoned. So, I mean, you don't have to have specific cards to summon him to the field. I like that. I like the 2800 body, the 2600 defense. That, that is pretty good for a level 8, but there are more explosive options available in the game. I think the problem I see with the card is that he has to destroy a monster by battle and send it to the graveyard. So if you're playing against macro or you're you're hitting something that's going to remove itself like a battle fader, very little seen Exodius, uh, DDS for Star Sparrow hitting in Hidden Arsenal 7, so on and so forth, that could end up being nil and void. And, I mean, it's... It, just stops normal and special summons of level 5 or higher monsters during their next turn. Granted, your Mermel Atlantean players are going to want to go, wanna go, wanna go into Abyss Megalo. And when Harpies hit, 
they're going to want to go into Big Eye or Dragosac. And with the prophecy, they're going to want to go into their big dog in Junon, so on and so forth. It's an answer to those decks, but then again, your opponent has time to plan. And they're probably going to have another part of an engine in their deck. So they're probably going to have a level 3 or a level 4 that's going to allow them to still spam the field and skirt Crimson Blader. In my opinion, Crimson Blader came a little bit too late. If he came back when we were heavy synchroing, I think he would have been absolutely positively amazing. But with the distinction of Xyz monsters going to ranks versus levels, it kind of killed how well Crimson Blader could have played out. That's my opinions on Crimson Blader. So I just, be a, I just want to be sure that you're noticing his card effect and then the relevance of his card effect to not just today's game, but the future of our game. Your opponent cannot normal or special summon level 5 or higher monsters during their next turn. There are there are decks that that won't affect, sure. Like, say for instance, wind-ups. You know, because they can still put a level 5 on the field with wind-up shark, for instance. So, and that's not normal summon or, or special summoning. That's his effect, you know, modulating his level. So, sure. He won't hurt wind-ups, won't hurt uh, rabbit variants, won't hurt evil swarm, uh, won't hurt fire fist. But out of all those decks, in any deck that's going to be running Crimson Blader as an option, I don't think they'll be fearing any of those decks except for uh, Evil Swarm because, you know, <laughs> the easy play to this is make a level 7 guy have a level 1 tuner. Um, so like Mermail, you know, if you can get a successful Crimson Blader effect, like say they have a Abyssalin down, you know, a common play is Abyssalin to Abyss Spike to discard and create some resource building. Um, but also another play, you know, in the mid to late game is if a uh, Abyss Lend is destroyed, they special summon Abyss Lead or Abyssteus or Abyss Megalo. That shuts down that option. So now they may have to get a dead spike. That's not really an answer uh, that they're looking for. Um, against Prophecy, Crimson Blader runs over all of their monsters quite easily. Um, and the only problem monster that it, it could come toe to toe with is High Priestess, which if he destroys one of their monsters, you know, barring he, he dodges, uh, what's the, the quick play fate, I think if he can dodge that, if he doesn't have to worry about that, then, you know, their linchpin monster is dead weight in their hand, uh, elemental dragons, it shuts down what 90% of the monsters in their deck. Uh, I think this is a, a quite relevant card and I think you really have to pay attention to, you know, I think it would have been nice in the synchro days. Uh, it would really slow the game down, possibly. But I still, I still think it's it's quite a relevant card. I'd say at the moment, at the moment, it's too late. When we look at elemental dragons hitting, when we look at harpies, and we look at the fact that we're going to have Mermel, Atlantean and stuff like that around then, it might be a little bit better because you're going to shut down some of those plays. But right now, in the current meta, with a lot of a lot of it being, uh, I mean, outside of Mermel's, everything else going 3, 4, I think right now, it's not shining at the moment. But Again, it's, that's it's, just it's, like saying Maxi is, is, was a card that was created too late, which is an incorrect statement as well. Because we had Maxi, what, two, three packs before plants became a problem, which is when Maxi saw its initial emergence into the metagame as a side deck and main deck option. Crimson Blader is perfectly timed, in my opinion. Because you, you have to view him just like you view Maxi. It's a card that may be in its release date, maybe not uh, in effective choice but what you know again this is a future card you know this is this is going to be an effective option well that's what i'm saying i'm saying right now i don't see him as effective 
But, no, but you're saying he's too late. With the next one to two packs? Well, he's too late right now at the very moment. Maybe I worded it that wrong. At this very moment, he's too late right now. But gotcha, with the next one, when the next one to two packs hit, when we look at Elemental Dragons and everybody's switching over to them, we look at Harpies and we look at people wanting to go into those sevens repeatedly and use Dragosack and Big Eye effects and you've got your Mermels that are still going to want to do that, then I think he's going to be really effective. But right now, where we're at right now, I don't see him as effective. In the next one to two packs, I see him making a comeback. So his price is somewhat low right now. I pick him up now because he's his price is low because he's not being used as much versus trying to pick him up when Lord of the Tachyon Galaxy and Judgment of Light hit because then he's going to be one of those cards that's going to skyrocket. I mean, it's like before we heard the announcement we were going to get Channeler and Harpy's Pet Dragon was at $15 and now the card's at $100 because we know that you can go into Dragon with Harpy's Channeler and... You've got a big eye or a drago sack in one turn. It, it kind of gives you that uh, market speculation we talk about a lot in our podcasts. Well, that that could also have something to do, like as far as his price goes. Like, how many effective cards have we gotten since, let's just say, the synchro era that were common rare or or less? Uh, not a lot, as where before. You know, sure, really good cards would be secret. They would be ultra. You know, once we got ultimates, they would be ultimates. But we still got good cards like, you know, te- or a uh, goat control format. One of the most prevalent cards in that format, Metamorphosis was a common. Sukiyomi was a common rare. Um, that so that just might be the case, you know. And they weren't that expensive then. So maybe that's this guy's case because still, like, do you consider Mermail the best deck right now? I consider it Saki. <laughs> I consider it an autopilot deck. I don't know if I would consider it the best, but it's a deck. No, no, no. We're not. We're not talking about like its its uh, ability to be efficient, uh, efficient in the the sense of drawing the the combo pieces it needs. I mean, would you consider? Do you consider any other deck in the game? Mm, I'd say it's a toss-up between Mermel and Prophecy. Both of them are pretty consistent in their plays right now. Just my opinion on the matter. Uh Uh-oh. Well, I think that's a good stopping point for the evening. (laughs) So, Fox, do you want to dance us out on this one? We're, you know, doing your outro stuff. I see a long written out list. <laughs> Anyways, so, uh, yeah, we'll continue on next week, I guess, unless Ginzo gets in here pretty quickly. Uh, there he is. I'm, I'm here. Thanks. Okay. Continue yeah. on, then. <laughs> Okay, so like uh, uh, the last point I was trying to get to was, you know, like, cons- you know, taking the the Saki factor because like throughout the history of Yu-Gi-Oh, the best decks have always you know had some level of sackiness, you know, just because they were built with the best cards of the game and they could probably run multiples of those best cards, or just cards that help to super synergize, you know, the the deck as a whole, which increases the odds you're going to open nutty hands. Like as far as performance goes. Do you think there is any other deck outperforming Mermail in our current meta? That's the question. In our current meta? The only one, as I was saying before, I think you lost connection that's even close is Prophecy. And then that goes back to just having a very effective engine. Draw engine. No, like they're not even on the map right now. Like, Prophecy's not on the map. What, they may have gotten one top in the last five events. Like, the second place to Mermail right now would be Firefist. 
as far as performance and you know what, what it's getting at the moment. But anyway, what I, what I was just trying to lead you to was the fact that Mermail is the best deck of the format, regardless of how sacky it is. And Crimson Blader, you know, they want to get to Abyss Gaios. If they can get to Abyss Gaios at an appropriate time, they just win if you don't have an answer. Crimson Blader shuts down their Abyss Gaios play because it shuts down Abyss Megalo, Abyss Theus, and Abyss Lee. So, like, even now, Crimson Blader is relevant because it's an answer to the best deck. And that's just the last comment I have. <laughs> so, just to wrap things up, uh, just want to tell people uh, we are hiring for a few positions. Take a look in the staff application thread. We do have some new prizes we got in from our partners at Eroll J. Take a look, it's under new prizes and also on the front page. If you're looking for custom made play mats, definitely check them out. Use the code MTCG2013. You receive five dollars off your order. But uh, we have some new price support coming along the way. Uh, some Mermel Atlantean stuff, some uh, Madolchi play mats, a Ice Barrier play mat, which is very nice, by the way, and some iPhone 4 and 4S covers with the uh, sites banners on it. Uh, make sure that you're here on Tuesdays and Thursdays as long as Dueling Network's here for us. We have our weekly championship series and we have our flash tournament for the Insector Ladybug map. And other than that, uh, I think that uh, about covers this week. Uh, Make sure you're getting your questions in. Uh, we want to do a few, full Q&A on next week. So uh, if you've listened through this podcast, whatever questions you want us to go over, go down to that thread member Q&A and ask. Uh, I guess I'll open it up and hopefully Nomad doesn't try to embarrass us and say that it can be anything site-related. Site uh, you'll get a related, what have you. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you want to hear about in our podcast. So go down there, post your questions, and next week we'll try to give the answers. And with that, I'm actually going to let Eddie dance us out. No, you're supposed to dance us out.